An interest rate cap is a derivative in which the buyer receives payments at the end of each period in which the interest rate exceeds the agreed strike price. An example of OCAP would be an agreement to receive a payment for each month the LIBOR rate exceeds 2.5%. Similarly an interest rate floor is a derivative contract in which the buyer receives payments at the end of each period in which the interest rate is below the agreed strike price. Caps and floors can be used to hedge against interest rate fluctuations. For example, a borrower who is paying the LIBOR rate on a loan can protect himself against a rise in rates by buying a cap at 2.5%. If the interest rate exceeds 2.5% in a given period the payment received from the derivative can be used to help make the interest payment for that period. Thus the interest payments are effectively cut at 2.5% from the borrower's point of view. Interest rate cap. An interest rate cap is a derivative in which the buyer receives payments at the end of each period in which the interest rate exceeds the agreed strike price. An example of OCAP would be an agreement to receive a payment for each month the LIBOR rate exceeds 2.5%. The interest rate cap can be analyzed as a series of European call options or caplets which exist for each period the cap agreement is in existence. In mathematical terms, a caplet payoff on a rate L struck at K is where N is the notional value exchange and is the day count fraction corresponding to the period to which L applies. For example, suppose you own a caplet on the six-month USD LIBOR rate with an expiry of the 1st of February 2007 struck at 2.5% with a notional of $1 million. Then if the USD LIBOR rate sets at 3% on the 1st of February you receive customarily the payment is made at the end of the rate period. In this case on the 1st of August, Interest rate floor. An interest rate floor is a series of European put options or floorlets on a specified reference rate, usually LIBOR. The buyer of the floor receives money if on the maturity of any of the floorlets, the reference rate is below the agreed strike price of the floor. Valuation of interest rate caps. Black model The simplest and most common valuation of interest rate caplets is via the black model. Under this model we assume that the underlying rate is distributed log normally with volatility. Under this model, a caplet on a LIBOR expiring at T and paying at T has present value where P is today's discount factor for TF is the forward price of the rate. For LIBOR rates this is equal to K is the strike N is the standard normal CDF. And notice that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the volatility and the present value of the option. Because all the other terms arising in the equation are indisputable, there is no ambiguity in quoting the price of a caplet simply by quoting its volatility. This is what happens in the market. The volatility is known as the black volume or implied volume. As a bond put it can be shown that a cap on a LIBOR from T to T is equivalent to a multiple of AT expiry put on AT maturity bond. Thus if we have an interest rate model in which we are able to value bond puts, we can value interest rate caps. Similarly a floor is equivalent to a certain bond call. Several popular short rate models such as the Hull White model have this degree of tractability. Thus we can value caps and floors in those models. What about collars? Interest rate collar. The simultaneous purchase of an interest rate cap in sale of an interest rate floor on the same index for the same maturity. A notional principal amount. The cap rate is set above the floor rate. The objective of the buyer of a collar is to protect against rising interest rates. The purchase of the cap protects against rising rates while the sale of the floor generates premium income. A collar creates a band within which the buyer's effective interest rate fluctuates and reverse collars. Buying an interest rate floor and simultaneously selling an interest rate cap the objective is to protect the bank from falling interest rates. The buyer selects the index rate and matches the maturity and notional principal amounts for the floor and cap. 
Buyers can construct zero-cost reverse collars when it is possible to find floor and cap rates with the same premiums that provide an acceptable band. The size of cap and floor premiums are determined by a wide range of factors. The relationship between the strike rate and the prevailing three-month LIBOR premiums are highest for in-the-money options and lower for at-the-money and out-of-the-money options. Premiums increase with maturity. The option seller must be compensated more for committing to a fixed rate for a longer period of time. Prevailing economic conditions, the shape of the yield curve, and the volatility of interest rates. Upsloping yield curve, cabs will be more expensive than floors. The steeper is the slope of the yield curve, ceteris paribis, the greater are the cap premiums. Floor premiums reveal the opposite relationship. Valuation of CMS caps Caps based on an underlying rate cannot be valued using simple techniques described above. The methodology for valuation of CMS caps and floors can be referenced in more advanced papers. Implied volatilities An important consideration is cap and floor volatilities. Caps consist of caplets with volatilities dependent on the corresponding forward LIBOR rate. But caps can also be represented by a flat volatility, so the net of the caplets still comes out to be the same. So one cap can be priced at one volume. Another important relationship is that if the fixed swap rate is equal to the strike of the caps and floors, then we have the following put call parity. Cap floor equals swap. Caps and floors have the same implied volume too for a given strike. Imagine a cap with 20% volume and floor with 30% volume. Long cap, short floor gives a swap with no volume. Now, interchange the vols. Cap price goes up, floor price goes down. But the net price of the swap is unchanged. So, if a cap has X volume, floor is forced to have X volume else you have arbitrage. A cap it strikes 0% equals the price of a floating leg regardless of volatility cap. Interest rate caps and their impact on financial inclusion. Research was conducted after Zambia reopened an old debate on a lending rate ceiling for banks and other financial institutions. The issue originally came to the fore during the financial liberalizations of the 1990s and again as microfinance increased in prominence with the award of the Nobel Peace Prize to Mohamed Yunus and Grameen Bank in 2006. It was over the appropriateness of regulatory intervention to limit the charging of rates that are deemed by policymakers to be excessively high. A 2013 research paper asked where are interest rate caps currently used and where have they been used historically? What have been the impacts of interest rate caps, particularly on expanding access to financial services? What are the alternatives to interest rate caps in reducing spreads in financial markets? Understanding the composition of the interest rate the research have decided that to assess the appropriateness of an interest rate cap as a policy instrument, it was vital to consider what exactly makes up the interest rate and how banks and MFIs are able to justify rates that might be considered excessive. He found broadly there were four components to the interest rate, cost of funds, the overheads, non-performing loans, profit, cost of funds. The cost of funds is the amount that the financial institution must pay to borrow the funds that it then lends out. For a commercial bank or deposit-taking microfinance institutions this is usually the interest that it gives on deposits. For other institutions it could be the cost of wholesale funds or a subsidized rate for credit provided by government or donors. Other MFIs might have very cheap funds from charitable contributions. The overheads The overheads reflect three broad categories of cost. Outreach costs The expansion of a network or development of new products and services must also be funded by the interest rate margin. Processing costs is the cost of credit processing and loan assessment, which is an increasing function of the degree of information asymmetry. General overheads General administration and overheads associated with running a network of offices and branches. 
the overheads, and in particular the processing costs can drive the price differential between larger loans from banks and smaller loans from MFIs. Overheads can vary significantly between lenders and measuring overheads as a ratio of loans made is an indicator of institutional efficiency. Non-performing loans lenders must absorb the cost of bad debts and write them off in the rate that they charge. This allowance for non-performing loans means lenders with effective credit screening processes should be able to bring down rates in future periods, while reckless lenders will be penalized. Profit lenders will include a profit margin that again varies considerably between institutions, banks and commercial MFIs with shareholders to satisfy or under greater pressure to make profits than NGO or not-for-profit MFIs. The rationale behind interest rate caps Interest rate caps are used by governments for political and economic reasons, most commonly to provide support to a specific industry or area of the economy. Government may have identified what it considers being a market failure in an industry, or is attempting to force a greater focus of financial resources on that sector than the market would determine. Loans to the agricultural sector to boost agricultural productivity as in Bangladesh. Loans to credit constrained SMEs as in Zambia. The researcher found it is also often argued that interest rate ceilings can be justified on the basis that financial institutions are making excessive profits by charging exorbitant interest rates to clients. This is the usury argument and is essentially one of market failure where government intervention is required to protect vulnerable clients from predatory lending practices. The argument, predicated on an assumption that demand for credit at higher rates is price inelastic, postulates financial institutions are able to exploit information asymmetry and in some cases short-run monopoly market power, to the detriment of client welfare. Aggressive collection practices for non-payment of loans have exacerbated the image of certain lenders. The researcher says that economic theory suggests market imperfections will result from information asymmetry and the inability of lenders to differentiate between safe and risky borrowers. When making a credit decision, a bank or a microfinance institution cannot fully identify a client's potential for repayment. Two fundamental issues arise. Adverse selection – Clients that are demonstrably lower risk are likely to have already received some form of credit. Those that remain will either be higher risk or lower risk but unable to prove it. Unable to differentiate, the bank will charge an aggregated rate which will be more attractive to the higher risk client. This leads to a raised probability of default ex ante. Moral hazard – Clients borrowing at a higher rate might be required to take more risk to cover their borrowing costs leading to a higher probability of default afterwards. The researcher claims that traditional microfinance group lending methodology helps manage adverse selection risk by using social capital and risk, understanding within a community to price risk. However, interest rate controls are most often found at the lower end of the market where financial institutions use the information asymmetry to justify high lending rates. In a non-competitive market, the lender likely holds the monopoly power to make excessive profit without competition evening them out. The financial markets will segment so large commercial banks service larger clients with larger loans at lower interest rates and microfinance. Institutions charge higher rates of interest on a larger volume of low-value loans. In between, smaller commercial banks can find a niche serving medium to large enterprises. Inevitably the missing middle, individuals and businesses will be unable to access credit from either banks or MFIs. The researcher found it intuitive that basic interest rate caps are most likely to bite at the lower end of the market, with interest rates charged by microfinance institutions generally higher than those by banks and this is driven by a higher cost of funds and higher relative overheads.
Transaction costs make larger loans relatively more cost-effective for the financial institution. If it costs a commercial bank $100 to make a credit decision on a $10,000 loan then it will factor this 1% into the price of the loan. The cost of loan assessment does not fall in proportion with the loan size and so if a loan of $1,000 still costs $30 to assess, the cost which must be factored in rises to 3%. This cost pushes the higher rates of lending on smaller loans. The higher prices are usually paid because the marginal product of capital is higher for people with little or no access to it. In implementing a cap, government is aiming to incentivize lenders to push out the supply curve and increase access to credit while bringing down lending rates. Assuming the cap is set below the market equilibrium, if above then lenders will continue to lend as before. The researcher thinks such thinking ignores the actions of the banks and MFIs operating under asymmetric information. The imposition of a maximum price of loans magnifies the problem of adverse selection as the consumer surplus that it creates is a larger pool, willing borrowers of unidentifiable creditworthiness. Faced with this problem, he proposes lenders have three options. Increase lending, meaning lending to more bad clients and pushing up NPLs. Increased investment in processing systems to better identify good clients. Increasing overheads, increased investment in outreach to clients, identified as having good repayment potential. Increasing overheads all options increase costs and force the supply curve back to the left. Detrimental to financial outreach as the quantity of credit falls, unless financial service providers can absorb the cost increases while maintaining a profit, they may ration credit to those that they can readily support at the prescribed interest rate, refuse credit to other clients and the market moves. The researcher asks if the story of interest rate caps leading to credit rationing is borne out in reality. The use of interest rate caps Though conceptually simple, there is much variation in the methodologies used by governments to implement limits on lending rates. While some countries use a vanilla interest rate cap written into all regulations for licensed financial institutions, others have attempted a more flexible approach. The most simple interest rate control puts an upper limit on any loans from formal institutions. This might simply say that no financial institution may issue a loan at a rate greater than, say, 40% interest per annum, or 3% per month, rather than set a rigid interest rate limit. Governments in many countries find it preferable to discriminate between different types of loan and set individual caps based on the client and type of loan. The logic for such a variable cap is that it can bite at various levels of the market, minimizing consumer surplus. As a more flexible measure, the interest cap is often linked to the base rate set by the central bank in setting monetary policy meaning the cap reacts in line with market conditions rising with monetary tightening and falling with easing. This is the model used in Zambia, where banks are able to lend at 9 percentage points over the policy rate and microfinance lending is priced as a multiple of this. Elsewhere, governments have linked the lending rate to the deposit rate and regulated the spread that banks and deposit-taking MFIs can charge between borrowing and lending rates. As some banks look to get around lending caps by increasing arrangement fees and other costs to the borrower, governments have often tried to limit the total price of the loan. Other governments have attempted to set different caps for different forms of lending instrument. In South Africa, the National Credit Act identified eight subcategories of loan, each with their own prescribed maximum interest rate. Mortgages plus 5% per annum, credit facilities plus 10% per annum, unsecured credit transactions plus 20% per annum, developmental credit agreements for the development of a small business, RRX 2.2 plus 20% per annum, developmental credit agreements for low income housing plus 20% per annum, short term transactions 5% per month. Other credit agreements plus 10% per annum, incidental credit agreements 2% per month.